Happy New Year! Well, almost. Welcome to this final episode of 2023 for the Mission Compass. So glad you joined us. We want to share with you how you can get involved in the Great Commission, telling other people about Jesus Christ, what He's done for you. Well, this week, it's the end of the year. Everybody's doing it. Countdowns, year in reviews. So we're doing it here at the Mission Compass. I picked some of our best guests, our best stories of the year of 2023 to share with you today. We got some milestones to share with you, some new partners, some mission trips, all different ways that people have chosen to tell others about Jesus Christ and God's love for them. Year in Review, Mission Compass, it's all about getting involved. Bonnie Sala joins us with a great testimony from the Guidelines Ministry. And hey, subscribe, like, notify. You don't want to miss an episode of this. We're going to kick off next year with a bang. But this year, sit back, relax, enjoy our year in review here on the Mission Compass. Welcome to GALCOM's Mission Compass podcast. To learn more about GALCOM and our guests today, visit galcom.org. Hopefully, as you listen to the testimonies today, you'll see where God has a place for you in His Great Commission. Maybe it's going somewhere. Maybe it's serving in a certain capacity. Hello, friend. Welcome to GALCOM's Mission Compass, your guide to the Great Commission. I'm Ron Harris. On today's Mission Compass, we want to update you on what GALCOM is doing around the world and also connect with a ministry partner who, like GALCOM, is making waves. Where do you fit in the Great Commission? Well, keep listening. We may have an answer for you. And here's your host, GALCOM's Tim Whitehead. Well, thank you, Ron. And friend, welcome to a very special edition, a year in review here on the Mission Compass. We've been looking back at our records and our notes and seeing that God has done incredible things through the ministry of GALCOM and through our partners around the world. And we wanted to share them with you. Some milestones from some of our partner ministries, some of the trips that we've been on and what God has done. So just sit back and relax. I'm going to be sharing some little elements of some programs that we recorded over the past year to show you just what God has done. Again, just to encourage you in your faith. Friends, it's called the Mission Compass. We want to point you in a direction to serving God. And hopefully as you listen to the testimonies today, you'll see where God has a place for you in his great commission. Maybe it's going somewhere. Maybe it's serving in a certain capacity. Uh, We just want to introduce you to our friends and the different opportunities that they share about how they serve God. So without further ado, some of the milestones. Well, earlier on in the year, our friends at Far East Broadcasting in Korea We're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Billy Graham Crusades. Way back in 1973, perhaps the largest open-air campaigns ever, ever on earth. Uh, Billy Graham headed over to Seoul, South Korea, and a pastor there by the name of Billy Kim was his translator. So we spoke to Chung Soo Kim, who handles all the communication of FEBC Korea with its foreign partners, about what that meant, what that event was all about, the impact it's had. And so here's Chung Soo Kim. Well... Billy Kim is an uh, ordained minister, born in Korea in 1934, and during the Korean War, he was befriended by U.S. Sergeant Carl Powers. Uh, Somehow, Billy Kim became a houseboy. Back then, there were hundreds. Sergeant Carl Powers singled him out and uh, befriended Billy Kim and helped him go to school in America during the war. Can you believe that? Huh. So his passport was written in handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he went to school in the U.S., Bob Jones Seminary, and came back as missionaries. In 1973, Billy Graham had crusades all over the world. Mm-hmm. But in 1973, particularly in Seoul, that was by far the largest of his crusades, among crusades. So two Billies, uh, they say, you know, he did a great job, he being Billy Kim. Of course, Billy Graham did a fantastic job through that event. Well, it was a five-day crusade, Mm -hmm. yeah, not just one day. Yeah, over three million people over the five days, the biggest crusade ever. Exactly. They say 3.2. And the last day, final day, more than a million, they say. It was a great milestone, great event, and that uh, sparked the uh, evangelization in Korea. 
through which megachurches were born. In fact, the largest Presbyterian church is in Korea. The largest mm -hmm. Methodist church is in mm -hmm. Korea. The full gospel or assemblies of God. So uh, that was 1973, Billy Graham crusade. And that particular time, Billy Kim was so busy flying back and forth to Jeju Island. There is an island down south, often referred to as the uh, Hawaii of Korea, a beautiful island. That's where they were starting FEBC. It's a very complicated story. FEBC was founded in 1945 in California. But the former name of FEBC Korea, HLKX, was founded by U.S. missionaries uh, by the name of Tom Watson. They sort of merged. They were having uh, challenges, and they asked Billy Kim to take over. So Billy Kim became the uh, director of HLKX and FEBC Korea in 1973. So absolutely, congratulations to our friends at FEBC in Korea and, and just to the wonderful celebrations there of the 50th anniversary of the Billy Graham Crusades that really sparked a worldwide evangelistic movement. In fact, there are more missionaries from South Korea than all of the Western uh, world, America, Canada, Great Britain combined. So what a tremendous testimony of what this crusade started. A great missionary movement, a great church movement, as Chung Su mentioned, as well as the real work of FEBC. But whenever you think about Korea, you always got to talk about North Korea. So I spoke with uh, Mr. Kim about what the impact has been, what kind of feedback they get as they specifically target North Korea with their gospel broadcasts. Well, in the past, we received a lot of physical letters from our listeners that are in China. In China, there's a lot of ethnic Koreans, uh, especially along the border between North Korea and China. We have about 30,000 North Korean defectors living with us in South Korea now. North Korea is the world's closest society or regime, and we are not allowed to exchange letters. Well, if we get letters from North Koreans, they are probably temporarily in China or other parts of the world, and they're sending mail to us. Do you get any testimonies from the defectors that have come across? Absolutely. We have North Korean defectors that went to seminary after they arrived in Korea, and they became ordained and uh, preached the gospel now. And we have them on our radio. So in their own dialect, they broadcast into their folks in North Korea. So it's very efficient. And we get feedback through them. Before they came to South Korea, they learned about South Korea. They wanted to come to South Korea because they heard FEBC. They did not have the Bible. Mm -hmm. They did not have or hymnals. So they hear FEBC broadcast. And they take down the words. They copy their own Bibles. So friends, you can see just how vital Christian broadcasting is. We talk a lot about overcoming barriers to missions here on the Mission Compass with radio. And one of them is the geopolitical barrier. We can cross borders that missionaries physically can't go with radio. So it's great to celebrate those 50 years since the Billy Graham Crusades there with Sung Choo Kim. Speaking of 50-year celebrations, we also celebrated 50th anniversary of Trans World Radio here in Canada. So we spoke to their director, Dan Rees, about how they celebrated by doing a round-the-world tour, visiting some of their partners. And here's Dan sharing about what they saw in the different countries they visited, starting in the Philippines. Elaine and Joel drove us about three, three and a half hours up some windy roads up into the foothills up into the mountain, about 4,000 feet up in the air up on the mountainside to a, a little village. Uh, couldn't really tell it was a village, quite frankly, but uh, we were driving <laughs> along this windy road and we came to a church on the side of the road. And it was a Christian and Missionary Alliance church that had been formed there several years ago, but now it's grown. They've actually had to build a new building. And uh, so they welcomed us in on a Thursday and they had about 100, maybe 120 people that came out on a Thursday. And these are people that are subsistence farmers. They're just from the local area. They're not wealthy people. They're not highly educated. But they came and they wanted to show us what 
discipleship essentials means to them. And so they spent a couple of hours doing uh, presentations, you know, doing some local indigenous dances that, that were important to them. And then people shared how discipleship essentials was impacting their lives. And, you know, they have 19 small groups in this little church and everybody was wearing a different t-shirt. Like the groups, each of the groups had their own t-shirts that they had made. Like this was a real big deal for them. So one was the faithful group or the encouraging group, or I can't remember all the names, but they, every group had its own theme, if you will, their own t-shirt, which was uniquely designed for them. And they had some identity uh, to that. And, and so we had uh, people that would get up and give testimony of how intentional discipleship and this small group was such an important part of their own personal growth. And, and so it was just such an encouragement to see this expression of DE working really, really well. In India, they're working on, again, a small group model, and they have produced content in many different languages. In fact, we were there to celebrate the launch of 150 languages, heart languages, that content had been produced in for the wow. people of India. Now, there are nearly 2,000, I think 1,600 or so languages uh, in India, and, and some would say more than that, but, uh, but so we've still got some way to go. But 150 languages is an incredible milestone. And so, Tim, what they did was they had just a wonderful celebration uh, for reaching this milestone. One of the things they did was they brought up 150 people, each one representing their tribe, their tongue. They had a sash on them with the name of the language. Very cool. And they were dressed in their typical local dress. So they each looked unique, but they then paraded them up onto the stage. And I've got this picture of 150 people representing 150 languages. And I tell you, that was just an incredibly moving moment for me to be able to see that in, in, this, in this location. Wow. If 50 year anniversaries don't impress you, how about celebrating the 100th anniversary of Christianity in Cambodia, we spoke to Makara Samfel, uh, the director of Krusa FM, Love FM, an FEBC affiliate in Cambodia, to talk about just about the growth of Christianity in that largely and officially a Buddhist nation. And just how it got to the point where the government is so favorable towards the church. Yeah, we thank God for this amazing, wonderful time together for 100 year celebration. And so my prime minister, they see all the good work from the Christian family, Christian organization. And so it's a good favor from God that my prime minister, he understand what we are doing, understand Christianity, and he opened heart to open the ceremony on the first day. And I really appreciate that so much. After I got done just being amazed that the government endorsed the Christian work there so much and was celebrating with them, uh, we started talking about uh, the nuts and bolts of how they do their ministry in Cambodia. And one question we often get asked at Galcom is about follow-up. Sure, you're broadcasting on radio, but is anybody listening? How do we know if, if anybody's responding to the gospel message? And so the ministry team there in Cambodia has a wonderful way of following up with the radios they distribute and the programs they offer. Yes, so what we do here, we have our audience relation team that we are going out to the provinces uh, every month, do the program follow-up, and we always work partnership very closely with uh, churches around Cambodia. We don't want to do alone. We always uh, partnership with a local pastor there. Later on, like we keep uh, checking, asking the feedback from the pastor. Sometimes they call to us because they have our phone number. They call so that they are listening. And so we have through phone system that they follow up uh, with our team. Because Cambodia, we, we can go to every provinces because Cambodia is quite small and we can travel a day or two days around. We broadcast and we also uh, give the feedback. I have to say, living in Canada, I find it amusing that they can get all around Cambodia doing follow-up in just a day or two. Uh, but we really appreciate our partnership with all of these ministries and what they're doing on the ground, getting the gospel, and we're proud to be part of it. We've got more stories about our direct involvement through our mission trips. But before we do that, Bonnie Sala, as she always does, comes and joins us with our Reset Devotional. Bonnie, over to you. Although she lived across the globe, the effects of the latest war in the Middle East had come to Zara's community. I'm Bonnie Sala with Reset. What seemed like a harmless protest on a corner in Zara's neat suburb had ended with a man down on the sidewalk bleeding and hours later dead. After a tense discussion about it with a neighbor, Zara felt exhausted. 
Each morning, some are waking up to rubble and debris strewn across their homes. Others wake to missing children and racking grief over a beloved friend. We were not made for this destruction and hate. We feel its alien agony wreaking havoc. And yet, in this darkness, the Bible tells us how to live as children of God, shining like bright lights in a crooked world. It says that God's light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. In these times, we hold together by fixing our thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Scripture directs us to think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. There are many broken places in this world where division and bitterness are pouring in, yet these are also entrances for light and love. You and I can pour kindness into chaos, even just in our tiny corners of our world, in simple ways, like answering gently when someone speaks harshly, making sure the people around us know that no disagreement can change our love for them, or sending someone an encouraging text, making food to share with a neighbor, hugging family and friends, telling them you love them, apologizing if needed, and forgiving if needed. When darkness closes in, we cling to, choose, and radiate God's light. I'm Bonnie Sala with Reset. To read, share, or hear this again, or to find more resources like this, visit guidelines.org. You may be listening to us on your computer, but you can also find us on your smartphone using Spotify, iTunes, or other streaming platforms. Just go to galcom.org and choose your favorite. Make sure to subscribe, follow, and share our podcast. Thank you, Bonnie. And friends, if you do want more resources, we actually have some here. Uh, If you would like to write to us and get a month's worth of Reset devotionals sent to you, We'd love to send that to you right away to just encourage you in your faith. And of course, visit guidelines.org for all of their other resources. Well, we've been celebrating a year in review here on the Mission Compass, all what God did through our program, through the ministry of Galcom. And one of the big things for us was our first mission trips. Since 2019, it was so good to get out face-to-face, working with our partners, handing out our radios. Our first trip was to Oaxaca, Mexico. And Al Wyatt, our missions team lead, led that trip. And so he has some stories to share about the ministry in Oaxaca, Mexico. So yeah, it's on the south side of Mexico, uh, bordering onto the Pacific Ocean. Mexico has over 300 languages and over 120, I believe, are in the state of Oaxaca. So it's very linguistically diverse. Uh, A lot of people think, oh, go to Mexico, speak Spanish. But where we were, Spanish didn't do very much. I'm used to traveling in South America and used to being able to communicate with people. But in the areas where we were, people were speaking other languages. In fact, to get to the Mije, which were only an hour away from where we were staying in Mitla, we'd go past two other language groups. So in just 15, 20 minutes, uh, you've got two completely different languages. You can see from Al's comments, the, the sheer task that Bible translators have to reach all these different people groups in this small area uh, with the good news of Jesus Christ. But I asked him, even if Wycliffe and Bible societies were to translate the Bible, what was the literacy rate like? I questioned everyone I met, including pastors, and not one of them could read the Bible in Mihe. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Radios, audio Bibles, is the most efficient way to get people the gospel. Well, from Oaxaca, Mexico, we go over to Bolivia, to the high Andes where the Quechua live. Had a great conversation with Alex Muir, our longtime partner with Pioneers, about the number of people and his impact in Bolivia with mission trips. Oh yeah, I have an arm length of statistics. We have had 332. Now, some of them have gone as many as 10 times. Uh, One couple actually have gone, each of them have traveled 11 times. Those people have come from 75 different churches in North America. They have delivered, hand-delivered, and and carried in 58,000 units, distributed one per family. And we have made 152 stops, distribution centers. And those centers, we have given out radios to at least one family from 1,800-plus communities. Friend, I keep on saying everyone has a part to play in the Great Commission. Maybe consider going with Alex down to Bolivia this coming year. 
You know, earlier in the program, I mentioned about how we get asked about follow-up. How do we know people are listening and our friends in Cambodia and their extensive follow-up program? The next most common question we get is, how durable are your radios? How long do they last? Alex has got a great story about just how long these Galcom radios last. When they see us with our SUVs and they only see four or five, maybe six people in the vehicle, many times there will be three or four people will want to ride because they know you're going out to the main road or something. So they want to ride. And the vehicle's only part, you know, that's only like having your back seat full when you've got five people in the car. <laughs> and you can fit 20 more in there. Come on. Of course, of course, you know. I mean, nobody's lying down on the laps of those who are in the back seat. So this fellow just, he came along in the morning. He was a seasonal worker. He had come from the city, from Cochabamba. And he'd gone there for potato harvest. Well, harvest was technically over, so now he was looking for a ride out to the main road so he could go back home. This man's name's Elias, and he gets in the back with Hector, and away we go. In the whole thing, I'm thinking, I'm driving on, and I'm thinking, okay, we, first thing we got to do is find out, does he know the Lord? And if he doesn't know the Lord, then we got to make sure he knows who the Lord is before we get to the main road. Mm-hmm. Well, as I'm thinking that through, Hector's processing my thoughts. He's in the back seat saying, you know, uh, do you know Jesus is your your Savior? Oh, yes, I know him. Oh, you do? Oh, when did you trust him? Well, I've known Christ as my Savior for for about 15 years. Oh, well, how old are you now? I'm 45. Oh, well, that's good. In fact, he says, I've got my radio with me. And so he pulls out this radio. And it's the 1949 model. I mean, it <laughs> goes back. Uh, well, actually, it's order number 649, and I think we're over 2,000 now. We are. So I'm going to look this up, how old this radio is. So anyway, he gets the radio out, and this is the old Goyi radio. It's got no solar panel on it. It's just got AA batteries in it. So he's running it off of AA batteries. How long have you had it? Well, I've had it 15 years. And his parents had it before that. So I'm not sure. It's up to you now to find out exactly how old this radio is, but it still works. Absolutely. So now I have this antique radio because when we got to the end of the road, we said he's got to have a new impact. So he's got the Bible. He's got all the, everything that we can give him. Well, I looked it up and that radio, radio order 649 was from 2007. So Elias's parents got the radio, passed it on shortly thereafter, and it's been feeding his soul since then. And that's why we love these radios. They're so durable. Well, from Mexico to Bolivia, up to Ecuador, where we sent a team not too long ago. And Gary Jones, one of the team members, uh, asked to join us here on the program. And just, hey, walk us through what are the nuts and bolts of one of our radio distribution trips? We each took in a suitcase of 100 radios each. And we were distributing those radios in two ways. One way was in local churches. So a pastor of a church had invited people in the congregation to come to a specific church meeting to receive the radios. But we also went out into surrounding communities and literally walked door to door, handing out the radios to people who had been previously selected to receive them. They weren't just distributed to everybody that we came across um, because we obviously wanted to to have the radios go to a good home, as it were, and and be used. That was fantastic, and it was a really neat experience going out, meeting people where they were, doing what they were doing, and just sharing a radio with them. It was fantastic. So one day, we took off on a two-hour bus ride up into the hills to a little town called Saraguero. It's about 9,000 feet up in the mountains, population of about 4,000. And there we met Radio El Buen Pastor, Radio of the Good Shepherd, and lots of local indigenous communities. And we went to the radio station and we were just introducing ourselves and learning about what was going on there. And at some point in this roundtable conversation, one of our team, Ellie, who speaks fluent Spanish, he went outside with one of the workers from the radio station. And then a little while later, he came back in. And the guy that he'd been talking to was just, you could see his whole face was excited. He was just on another level. And and we didn't know what had gone on. 
Anyway, it turns out that this young guy has been doing a lot of work, particularly with many of the ethnic population in the very, very rural communities there in the jungle. And they don't speak Spanish. They speak their local language of Quechua. And he was struggling because he didn't have any resources of the Bible in their language. Ellie had just shown him on Ellie's phone a website where he can access all of the Bible, stories, the gospel in story form in Kichwa. And this guy came in and it was like, you don't know what you've just done for me. And for me, that was an absolute highlight because it was a moment when I knew that Ellie was there for that reason. Well, friend, before I just uh, hand everything over to Ron and wrap up the final show of the year, I just want to say thank you for tuning in week after week, for praying for the ministry of Galcom and for our partners that we work with, and for supporting the ministry, helping us get radios around the world. But we're called the Mission Compass for a reason. And that's to point you in the direction of serving Jesus Christ in the Great Commission. So one last time, I want to appeal to you, please don't sit on the sidelines. God has designed you and created you to serve him and to be a witness for him. Consider going on a mission trip with us. We've got four planned next year. Alex Muir's got three down to Bolivia. Uh, Gelcom USA has got several planned next year. All sorts of opportunities for you to exercise an evangelistic muscle and serve God in the Great Commission. There's nothing more rewarding than seeing someone come to faith in Jesus Christ. God bless you. Happy New Year. Well, friend, we're at the end of our program today. And you've been listening to Galcom's Mission Compass, your guide to the Great Commission. There are many ways to partner with us. To find out more, visit our website at galcom.org. That's galcom, spelled G-A-L-C-O-M, dot org. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. I'm Ron Harris. Thanks for joining us today on Mission Compass, a radio ministry of Galcom International. If you enjoyed this podcast, we upload a new episode every Monday. You can also find us on the radio or other streaming platforms. We have a list on our website. Make sure to subscribe, follow, and share our podcast. Please rate this episode and leave a review. We would love to hear back from you. And we also want to know where you're listening from. So click Mission Compass on our website, tell us, and we'll send you Galcom's devotional, 30 Days of Faith.